So on that note, I'd like to thank David Saffer for joining us today and uh, introduce him. He's a, a Southern California professional photographer and photo educator, and uh, he's been doing a lot with me on color management for, for video capture, for video editing, and for video display. And uh, that work that we've been doing over the past few months has kind of been distilled into this presentation. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing it myself. So thank you for joining us, David. Hi, everybody. This is David Saffer. Um, let's get started. Thank you for the nice introduction, David. We're going to talk about color management for video capture. Um, I gave this presentation to a smaller group in New York a few days ago. And it occurred to me when I was speaking to them that there's a couple of important points that I want to communicate, um, particularly at the beginning. One of them is, is that the skills and, and the equipment and, and a lot of the uh, experience that you have from your, from your uh, still photography, I misspoke a little bit, but let me start over again. The expertise and the experience and the equipment that you have from your still photography is going to carry over into the world of video. A lot of it is very similar, although the vocabulary may be a little bit different. You'll find that the activities are very similar. Uh, some of the fundamentals, like getting it right in the camera, are absolutely key to both areas of activity. The color management concepts and execution are very similar, although sometimes the tools will change or the software will change. So I'm going to approach this from the standpoint of the color workflow and take you down a path where we're going to start off with things that look like we're talking about still photography, but very quickly we're going to diverge and go down a, you know, a fork in the road and start talking about video management. And you'll see the crossover as that starts to happen. It will become obvious to you that it's, it's not at all intimidating. It's very accessible. It's the kind of thing that, uh, that you should be able to pick up and start doing yourself in short order. So just talking about color management and doing a little bit of review, <clears throat> Color management is the ability to efficiently reproduce consistent, predictable, and repeatable color across a range of devices. And we're going to get into this um, uh, in a new way in, in, in one respect in that we're talking about video cameras versus stills. What if you have two video cameras on set? What if you're using two displays or you're handing off your work to someone else to finish editing and post-production? So now color management really becomes an ever, ever more important tool for you in, in your work and, and satisfying your clients and satisfying your creativity and your artistic sense. So a calibrated workflow is always more efficient and predictable. We're going to go from capture to image processing to display and processing and post-production to the output device. And again, we're, gonna, we're going to try and, and wherever we can make the tie or the connection, the convergence of still in motion. Now, we have a new product. I want to talk about that for just a moment. It's a good way to introduce the rest of the material. Uh, we have a new kit called the Spider HD. I'll tell you what's in it in a moment. But it's an all-around solution for still and video photographers and videographers. It lets you control color easily and effectively from the scene to the camera to post-production. It's uh, packed in a rugged aluminum case at a very attractive bundle price. It also happens to be the item that we're giving away at the end of this presentation as a, as a little incentive for everybody. So it comes with the Spider 4 Elite HD, uh, which is the familiar Spider 4 sensor technology, uh, the Spider Cube, which is this, the small and uh, calibration and light balancing tool that makes a big impact on color, correct color temperature and exposure settings. This is something I, I think that many of you have heard about before. And of course, the spider checker, which is our 48 color test chart. All of these together enable you to control color and density from seeing the camera to editing to final output for consistent, superb color. One of the most important things I think th that we can keep in mind, and if there's one takeaway from today, maybe one out of two or three, uh, one takeaway that I want you to, to keep in mind is that getting it right in the camera is more important than ever. Most of us are shooting uh, video using a DSLR or a dedicated video rig. Most of those cameras, with some exceptions, notably the RED camera, most of those cameras are shooting a compressed, what's called a compressed codec, which is very similar to JPEG. 
So going back to our early days when we were all shooting digital in JPEG, we all know what the compression issues are, how digital artifact can creep in, how it limits dynamic range to say five to six stops versus perhaps 10 or 11 or 12 stops in RAW. And so you really do have to get it right in the camera. And you also have to think about, can you really get it right in post if you, if you don't get it right in the camera? And the answer is, not so much. Uh, when you're shooting JPEG, it, it really the same thing applies to shooting video. You've got much less latitude and, and, and wiggle room when you're in post-production. In fact, the JPEG, the, sorry, the video compression is clipping a little bit in the highlights and shadows even beyond what you get in a JPEG. And so it's really, really important to get the exposure right and to get the color balance right in the camera before you start, you know, before you start working. We want to be doing color accurate image editing. That means uh, in many cases, we're not working with just one display, but two or three. We want to harmonize those. If we're using a colorist to help us in post-production, we want to make things easy for them and, and protect the efficiency and keep the cost and quality under control. David, if I could jump in here for a moment. Um, when we're talking about the difference between video and still in terms of you know the JPEG style compression used on most video. Uh, there's actually a, a very nice review of a new video camera on Luminous Landscape a couple of months ago and it's a 4K camera so here we have uh, Luminous Landscape basically saying spend the money go 4K now it matters even though there's no actual end use that currently uses that kind of resolution uh, spend the money on the bigger monitors and you know the more expensive monitors all of the uh, more expensive uh, stuff that you need the drives and the communication systems for 4k and then somewhere in the article they said oh and there's a version of this that shoots raw for a thousand bucks more but don't bother to get that and I looked at that combination of statements and I thought wow they're advocating for a resolution you can't use at the moment but they're advocating against a bit depth that you absolutely can use right this moment so there are getting to be raw cameras. Even even the uh, little GoPro is almost a raw camera at this point. You shoot raw, you only get 15 frames per second, but that's getting pretty close to giving you that extra bit depth. So we would all love to be shooting in raw, and we will all, everybody who does video, even with a DSLR, a few years from now will take raw for granted. But in the meantime, it's extremely important to get things right in the camera. I mean, not that you can afford to blow out your highlights even in RAW, but you certainly can't afford to make other uh, compression errors if you're shooting JPEG. You can, you can fix a lot of stuff later in RAW, and now that we're working in video without that function with many of the cameras, except for the black magic and the red and the airy and the really high-end stuff, uh, we're in a position where we really need to, uh, to get it right in the camera. So uh, the color tools that allow you to do that are particularly important. Thank you, David. Sure, and you know, just carrying David's point forward a little bit more, most of us that are, including me, that are getting involved in video are using the equipment we already have, like a Canon 5D Mark III, and that is definitely uh, a JPEG style codec, codec, and it's definitely not got a lot of dynamic range compared to a RAW file. And of course, all those, although those raw cam, those raw capable cameras are coming online. They're not cheap, uh, so you, there's many of them are new cameras with new lens mounts, and so the adoption of those may take a little while, or may take more than a little while. And so between now and the time that any of us decide to go for better equipment or more equipment, we really have to pay attention to the fundamentals. The Spider Cube is a device that I think that many of you are, are quite familiar with. It's made out of a polymer. It's a 3D gray card in a sense. Uh, it's very unique design and construction. I use it for exposure management and also for in-camera white balance. Um, one way that I, I and I also use it for post-production and color and gray balance. And let's start with the third one um, in the sense that you can see right here that there's a gray area on the, uh, the shape of the spider cube. And I will use the color balance eyedropper to color correct my stills and my video in post-production using this tool. 
It's useful for handheld and tethered shooting and video. It's useful in post-production and studio and location work. One way that you can use it, I'm going to um, skip this slide. One way that you can use it, for example, this is a still image editing application, but you can see that I'm on the spider cube. I'm using it the bright side of the spider cube because that's where my primary light source is. I want to color balance to the primary light, not the secondary light or the fill light. And so I'll take that eyedropper and go over to the brighter side of the spider cube. You also can use the spider cube to set your dynamic range by using the white and the black points. There's a black trap. It might be hard to see on your web browser. Some web browsers do clip things pretty seriously. Uh, in any event, it's a multi-purpose tool. It's very handy to have in your camera bag. You can also use the spider cube to set the in-camera white balance. And here's another one of the key takeaways for today is that before you start shooting, whether you're using a spider cube or the gray card on the spider checker, it's really quite important to set an in-camera white balance before you start shooting. And some people will say to me, well, what about the buttons on the back of the camera? And this chart, for example, illustrates the values that are attached to those. Incandescent at 3,000K, flash at 5,400. That's great. I mean, they get you in the neighborhood. But here's the hitch. What about the color values that are in between? And, and there's no such thing as a standard scene unless you've got very, very highly controlled studio lighting. What about those color values that are in between? If you've got a, a, a color scene that's at 4,000K, what do you do? You don't have a button on the camera for it. So you really have to have the flexibility of that in-camera white balance. Now, on the Nikons, which is the kind of camera that you're seeing right here, there's a white balance button on the back. You push the white balance button, fill the frame with the spider cube, and push the shutter button, and voila, you're white balanced. On the Canon 5D Mark III, there is a white balance choice in one of the uh, on-screen menus. You push that. You fill the screen with the spider. You fill the screen or the viewfinder with the spider cube or a gray card, and you set your white balance that way. Once you've got that set for your lighting condition, you've got a much better starting point for post-production. I recommend that if you do change your lighting setup or you do change your scene, that you redo this, so that. For each clip, there is a neutral starting point for post-production for yourself or your colorist, and it makes their work or your work much easier as a result. Now, I'm not going to read you this slide. I know it's an eye test. Um, there's a lot of information on here that you can go back to later on when you look at the recorded version of this. The spider checker is 48 color patches. Uh, it's contains most of the primary, all the primaries for sRGB, two gray ramps plus some skin tones and some intermediate tones. But I think the most important thing here, well, there's, there's several important things here, but one of the most important things here is that you can use this to create an, a, uh, a calibration for your camera. Uh, these panels flip over so you can use gray panels to create an in-camera white balance. And of course, if you include this in your shot at the beginning, you can use the color eyedropper, or the white eyedropper, to color balance in post-production. So what one normally does is we take a photograph of the spider checker, um, and I'll show you the software in a moment and how that works. But the software that we have supports an HSL preset or calibration for Adobe Photoshop CS or CC, Adobe Lightroom, Hasselblad Focus, or DaVinci Resolve 11. And what that will do is characterize your camera and give you excellent color for your, 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 um, for your use in post-production. Now, interestingly, uh, David mentioned before the GoPro camera, a lot of people are mixing cameras on set. Uh, they're using a couple of cameras at a wedding, for example, and maybe a third one off to the side uh, as a backup. And, of course, lens sensor combinations uh, are always a little bit different, even if they're from the same camera manufacturer. You really want to harmonize the color across the platforms that you're using. So and you may even have different cameras. It's possible that you've got a second shooter who has a camera that's different than yours. What you want to do is shoot the spider checker in your lighting condition and make sure that you have a calibration, a basis for a calibration later so you can harmonize the color from all the cameras 
and then in post-production it's much easier with that neutral starting point to mix the streams of video and create something that's really special. Once you take a photograph of the spider checker, you import it into your image editor, you adjust it according to the instructions that we give you, and then you export that file into the, cam the utility, the spider checker utility, and that will create a preset for Lightroom or Photoshop or Focus at all, all of those different uh, software applications. Uh, we recently added DaVinci Resolve 11, and so we're moving forward into the video arena quite nicely. Thank you very much. And all of these, all of these applications are going, you know, once you have these camera calibrations completed, all these applications are going to take them and very painlessly integrate them into your video workflow and make it much easier for you to complete your work. Now, the way you photograph this very briefly is you set up the camera and the spider checker uh, so that the plane of the spider checker and the sensor plane, the plane of the sensor are in parallel. Aim the center of your lens at the center of the spider checker and, and take a raw or even a JPEG photograph of the target. You can also turn the panels around. Uh, the panels come out and they turn around and you can use these gray targets to custom white balance your camera. We've got a row of gray patches on either side. These run in 10% increments on each side. And you can also use these to gauge your exposure. If you start to see that they're merging together on screen, then you obviously have an issue at this end on, of underexposure and overexposure at the top end. Now, some interesting things. Lightroom can now catalog clip and even make basic adjustments to your video. You can use the spider checker in Lightroom presets to correct color for your video camera. So like I said before, even a rig like this Canon C300 can be harmonized with a 5D Mark III or even, dare I say it, a Nikon camera, um, a GoPro. Uh, I know several people that are doing that. And of course, like I said before, that makes things much easier for you in post-production. Now, we have a calibration device, the, the Spider 4 Elite. It's part of the Spider HD package. The operating software has been changed so that there's um, sort of a fork in the road right at the beginning when you start the software. Uh, you can pick whether you're going to calibrate a display, which is a laptop or desktop, the one that we're most familiar with, uh, connected to a computer. Or you can calibrate a display that's connected to a video stream, such as a DVD or Blu-ray player. So in this case, we're going to uh, pick the new one, which is a TV or Blu-ray, and we're going to walk you through that calibration process. Now, what you need, of course, to get this started, you're going to need the Spider 4 Elite HD device. Uh, you're going to need the Spider Web if you have a big display, and that's simply an elastic harness that holds the uh, calibration device on screen. You'll need a laptop or a desktop running the software, a DVD or Blu-ray player, and we give you a disc with test patterns on it. It's a little bit different than the process for a computer calibration. So those test, those test patterns are going to be displayed on your TV, and we're going to use those to gauge our progress and, and as a measurement tool as we go forward. What we're going to be doing is setting the display to optimal adjustments for viewing video content. And those adjustments are brightness, contrast, color, tint, the white point preset, and sharpness. Now, not every television has these, but many video reference displays will have these controls and more. Now, let me just look at this for one moment. Yes, you'll be prompted to bring up the appropriate test patterns on screen from the Blu-ray player. And now this becomes a process of switching back and forth between the controls for the computer and the controls for the television. Because the television is connected to the DVD, that's a separate loop. And the, the, the laptop or desktop is connected to the spider colorimeter device, which is reading the television or video reference screen. At that point, you're going to be adjusting the television according to the instructions from our software. And it's going to remeasure 
and make another recommendation for a readjustment. And for each parameter, you may make two to five to six adjustments, depending on the device that you're using. So actually, I did mean to mention that there is a checklist, sort of a pre-flight checklist, that walks you through everything, all the things that you need to set up. I just described all of them except to mention two things. The first is that you want to warm up your TV and your Blu-ray or DVD player for at least 20 minutes. You want to get them into operating temperature and operating conditions so you get accurate adjustments. And you want to give yourself 20 to 30 minutes to complete the calibration process here. Now, the first time I did this, I took everything out of the box, set it up on my work table, put it all together, and all told, it was less than 30 minutes. So that's a good sign. It's, it's not an onerous task, let's put it that way. So starting off in the operating software, you can see there's a number of choices here. Uh, we've got direct view CRT TVs, believe it or not, plasma, LCD, and LED TVs, rear projection, and front projection. Now, for most of us who are, are editing video, we're going to have either a commercial television or we're going to have a reference video display. Here's a quick look at what the spider web looks like in terms of the elastic harness that holds the colorimeter on the screen. And now here's an example of, of the prompt that you're going to see to bring the target online from the DVD player. That means you're going to be pushing the chapter controls on the DVD remote or on the DVD itself. You're going to see the different test patterns on screen. The, col the, the colorimeter software is going to prompt you to take a reading, so you're going to click to continue. And it's going to take a reading, and it's going to recommend a change. It's going to recommend an adjustment one way or the other via the on-screen controls or via the remote control. Then it's going to measure it again. And as I said before, this can go back and forth for two or three cycles, possibly more. Here's another example of the same sort of thing. In this case, we're adjusting color. There's a number of patterns. It takes a little bit of patience, but it's certainly not beyond the technical capabilities of somebody who's familiar with running cameras and similar equipment. When you're finished, there's going to be a summary shown that's going to give you a readout of the adjustments that you've made to your output device. So we have here brightness, contrast, color, tint, etc. And it's going to show you where you left everything when you completed this task. You can print this report and save it for later. Let's say in some cases that you have an event where you need to reset this output device or you've moved it or someone else has been working on it and has changed things. You can return to this state and have some confidence that you're going to be seeing correct dynamic range, correct color, that sort of thing. Now, moving along, we'll talk a little bit about computer display calibration. Uh, this, of course, is very important. Uh, many of us are editing the video on computers that are connected to what I would call a normal computer display. It's a computer-driven display. And, of course, these need to be calibrated as well. So you can harmonize. Sometimes we have two displays, one for the images and one for the tool panels. Many people have a third display, which is the TV or reference display, so they can see what their output is going to look like on, you know, and it's a, and its eventual destination. And so, as per usual, uh, we're going to put the colorimeter on the screen. The software is going to show a series of color patches. The colorimeter is going to read each patch and, on the fly, make corrections to the video card and the computer, and make sure that that color is up to standard. So you're seeing the right color and the right dynamic range. One of the things that, that really troubles some people is how bright these screens are coming out of the box. The typical operating range in terms of brightness, if you want to put a numeric value to it, is around 120. A lot of these screens come out of the box. They're set at 300 or more, which is much too bright for practical use. It's going to blow away your highlights. It's going to mess up your, your perception of shadow detail. You really want to get your dynamic range under control just as much as you want to get your color under control. And so here's an illustration showing some anemic color patches that are uh, almost magically being transformed into the correct um, 
hue and saturation and brightness. And from that point forward, you're in a position where you're editing the right thing in the right way. I also want to point out that Spider 4 can also handle uh, calibration of new laptops and wide gamut displays, uh, even your iPad and your iPhone, and a fairly wide range of the Android phone devices. It's a seven channel sensor, so it covers the color spectrum better than a three channel RGB sensor, which is most commonly found. This is what the first software screen looks like. Uh, here's another takeaway for you, an important point. Look at the values in these drop down menus. This is one of the first screens that you're going to see. And you can see the gamma here is set to 2.2. The white point is set to 6500. And as I mentioned before, the brightness is set to 120. These are the values that I'd like you to start with. These are the ones that we recommend as a good starting point. Most people will find these to work quite well for them. If you find that you're really having to increase the brightness of the screen so you can see it well, you're probably working in, in a studio or workshop or in a room where there's too much ambient light. And that's affecting both your perception of color because your eye responds to the brightest thing in the room, but it's also affecting it's, it, it's impacting your ability to do your work because if you have to crank the screen up too high, like I said before, you're going to destroy your highlight detail and you're going to affect your shadows. And it's just not good for the end result. There are tests built into the software system. Um, you can see here that this teardrop is the limit of what we call human color vision in a 2D view. Uh, this is a wide gamut display. I wanted to show you that the, the Spider 4 is quite capable of handling wide gamut displays. And you can see that the red outline is quite a bit outside Adobe 98 RGB, which is quite a robust color space. So you're, you're in a very good position here to be editing photographs. sRGB is a smaller color space. That's pretty close to what you're getting from the video codec from most uh, video cameras. That that video color space is called Rec. 709 in most cases. It's a little bit smaller than sRGB. So the Spider 4 can handle all of your needs on both sides of the equation. We have a test uh, facility, a utility built into the Spider 4 software. You can see over here, this is a before view. I wanted to break this out so you could see the, how anemic the grass looks. The sky really isn't really looking very natural, nor is the building, the church. And if you come back over here to the calibrated view, you can see how vibrant this garden looks and how deeply blue the sky is compared to the rec red brick of the church. So you really get quite a benefit both in terms of density and in color. Now we have some other tests. Um, these monitor ratings are uh, pretty extensive. We measure gamut and what's called tone response, the white point contra contrast, uh, luminance uniformity, I'll show you that in just a second, color uniformity and accuracy, and we give an overall rating to the, to the display. So as time goes on, you can judge how well your display is doing and how well it's meeting your needs. Again, here's one of the tests. We've already seen this one. This test on the right is a map of luminosity on a screen. You can see this was an older screen. The center is kind of the sweet, sweet spot, but over in the corners here, it's, it's really starting to fall down. And so it's a very useful test. Um, and actually, this is the color uniformity to brightness test. But in any event, this is a very useful test in the sense that it really tells you whether or not that screen is performing as you need it to. In general, um, I try to make it a rule to edit the, the really most, the most important things in the middle of the screen, regardless of which screen I'm using. Uh, that goes for laptops, desktops, any of them. They all generally tend to be a little bit better in the center, that sweet spot, that circle, just like the lenses are, maybe for different reasons, but there is still a sweet spot in the center. Now, Lee Varis is a good friend of David and mine. Uh, I'm going to read you a couple of quotes from him. Spider HD is my preferred solution for tonal linearity and computer display calibration and beats my personal calibration technique for video reference display calibration. 
And this is a man who he's a very large brain. He's a very intelligent guy. He's very much into quantitative analysis. He went through a lot of testing and evaluation before he made that statement. So now you're in a position where you don't just have to settle for whatever you happen to get in the camera when you're working, uh, you know, you're doing your video work. You can actually control the camera from the time of capture and set it up properly, get it right in the camera, get your computer displays set up correctly, moving along to your video reference displays or your field displays that are mounted on camera for your field work. And of course, know that when you hand off your material to someone else to work on, that it's correct, it's in the right space, it's usable and workable. Now, let me just take a look at something here. David, how are we doing with the questions? We have a little bit of extra time. Are there any questions that we can address online? Well, I haven't scrolled down to see if I'm behind. It's only three or four more. One question has come up more than once has to do with upgrades. And um, <clears throat> the painful answer that I'm giving people is that there are no upgrades available to Spider HD because the, uh, the bundle is already so heavily discounted over the price of the component products that that wouldn't be possible. So um, if you own a Spider now and you're looking at the Spider HD as the product you need to own next, then I think your best solution is eBay. Well, that's not an official recommendation. Uh -huh. but, uh, it's certainly possible to resell your Spider products and have the next person register them. Now, I see a question on here, and I don't know if you answered it. I can't see the answers. Uh, recommend a fast and reliable card reader for CF and SD memory cards. Um, there's a couple around. I don't know if you answered this, David, or not. I, I took a pass on that since it wasn't really to the topic today, but feel free. Um, there's a couple that I use. The one that I'm using right now is set up with a USB uh, connector. I like it because it's a clamshell and it closes up, and, and you know, it, I don't think it's any more reliable or quick than any of the other top of the line. It's made by Lexar. I don't remember the model number, but it's got a clamshell, so it closes up. That means dirt can't get into it. Dirt is the biggest thing that seems to kill CF and SD cards. And of course it has a USB connection, connection so it's reasonably fast. So that's the one that I have the most experience with. Let's see what else is here. Uh, there's a question here, main benefits of Spider 4 Elite over the Spider 3. The Spider 4 Elite is about 25% more accurate than the Spider 3 Elite. There were improvements on the software and the hardware side. Um, the Spider 4 was introduced, what, David, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago? Yes. So the, so the Spider 3 is, is not quite out of date. It's still being used by a number of people, but I certainly wouldn't say that it's, it's up to par as compared to Spider 4. Yeah, there there are new filters in Spider 4 that are um, are much more stable filters for over time and with changes in temperature and humidity. So the the Spider 4 tends to hold its accuracy for a longer life expectancy than previous Spider generations because of newer filter technology. And there's also what we call weighted coefficients. This is a patented function that we have in there that makes the Spider more accurate on different display types. So if you have a Spider 3 and you're working with traditional monitors that are as old as your Spider 3 or thereabouts, then you're probably fine. If, on the other hand, you're looking to purchase a new display and you're getting into the new, you know, green, blue, black lights or the, uh, you know, OLED displays and things like that, any of the newer technologies are much better uh, managed by the newer products. So Spider 4 is definitely an improvement for difficult to calibrate monitors, which can mean really bad, really old ones, but more often it's kind of difficult new technologies. Now there's also a question here about uh, the difference between Spider 4 Elite and the Spider 4 Elite HD that is in this package, uh, what the comparison between the two would be, and the answer is for calibrating computer displays there is no difference. This package's job is not to uh, in increase the features or functionality or activity of, of calibrating your computer displays. It's to merge that process as seamlessly as possible with other color management activities. So if you 
are looking to move into video or if you for other reasons feel the need for the other components of this bundle, then it's a very good deal. If your main concern is calibrating your computer displays, then Spider 4 Elite is just fine. Now, I don't usually name drop, but I did happen to notice that uh, <laughs> Neil Snape is in the audience today. I'm honored to have one of the world's leading uh, glamour photographers uh, taking this uh, webinar. But what interests me even more is to, to scan down through the list of names attending today and see recognized names of photographers and to realize that um, everyone, you know, most every photographer has to have one eye on video these days, whether they've made the move yet, whether they're doing a little bit of it, or whether they're actually earning their income from it. And I know people who made far less money three years ago doing photo than they're making today doing video plus some photo. Uh, so which, whatever stage you're at, it's, uh, I'm pleased to see uh, you know, existing people who are already experts in their field jumping in and learning a new field here because it's, uh, it's exciting times for those who are willing to jump off the dock. Now I just had one more question here that I wanted to try and get to and I lost it, so bear with me for one second. There's a question here about Rec. 709 and sRGB, which have similar color spaces and gammas, and it's asking about P3 and Rec. 2020. And of course, Rec. 2020 is a dream fantasy color space larger than the human vision on all sides. One can get in trouble with things like that. Uh, certainly, it's possible to make reference to those, but when you're calibrating a field display, for instance, Atomos uses the spider and bundles the spider with their field displays for calibration. Those are all being calibrated effectively to Rec. 709. <clears throat> this doesn't mean you can't shoot larger color spaces. It just means that's the amount you're going to reasonably be able to see in the field anyways, and therefore that's the preview they're going to show you. If you want to, uh, to see larger spaces, you're going to have to do that in the studio using uh, you know, a high-quality wide gamut display of some kind and that's where you know good monitor calibration comes in is you have to <clears throat> this is something I answered in another question previously someone is saying when they calibrate colors always seem to be too saturated and the answer is interesting the calibration has very little to do with saturation it mostly smooths out the the tone response curve from black to white and sets the white balance correctly and makes sure the gray balance all the way down the chain from white to black is accurate. That's about all the calibration does. The profile, on the other hand, defines you know whatever wacky oversaturated green may be in your color space and things like that. That's where the control of the primary colors comes in. So typically, if you calibrate your monitor and you're seeing oversaturated colors in program X, then the question is, is program X color managed? Because if it's not using your display profile, you're only getting about half the value out of your calibration. So using color managed applications is key. Unfortunately, when we used to talk about in still imaging, the list of non-color managed applications, they were mostly low cost Windows based image editors, not the serious apps that, that most of our customers are using. In video, when you say, name me a non-color managed application, I can start right off and say Adobe Premiere. Wow, you know, <laughs> do I need to continue if that's, if that's the top of the list? Because you have to understand this is not a world that was based on color management. And at this point in time, if you said name a full featured video uh, non-linear editor that is color managed, the answer would be, gee, I'd have to think about that one, see if I can even come up with the name of one. Uh, probably the most full featured product that is truly color managed and uses the display profile correctly at this point in time, and it's not really a display profile, it's a LUT, as they call it in video, would be uh, Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve. And that's really more of a color control tool than it is a nonlinear editor, though it's getting more editing features all the time. So we have this situation where <clears throat> we're moving into a field where um, monitor calibration, ICC profiles are not the standard, and other than, say, Final Cut are, are not typically being supported there in the same way. So you have, to, you have to watch what you're doing as you're using color management in your video work to see which applications are using it fully, which applications are using it partially, meaning getting the value of calibration but not profiling, and, and which ones are not using it at all, which are fairly rare at this point. Did you have another one to answer, David? I think that's it. 
Well, that sounds good to me. I'm it's hard, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to keep up with all of them because the GoToWebinar panel is so small. It's very hard to navigate. <laughs> and if you're that's, not keeping if you're not keeping up with it, that list gets away from you really fast. Yeah, that's what a retina display is all about. Oh, that's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't make fun of my computer. Okay, I have a question here about Spider HD and how it's powered. Um, the answer is there are multiple products in Spider HD. The Spider itself is a USB device, so it's powered via USB. The Cube and the Checker are non-powered devices. They have no electronics. They have, um, you know, effectively very little software. They're, uh, you know, targets, and and uh, and their purpose in life is to uh, be spectrally neutral and spectrally designed, and to put the correct colors and grays in front of you, and to um, to do things like with the cube to distinguish between your primary light source and your fill light. So um, so those things don't require batteries. So we're uh, very pleased to have a few products on our list that are not electronic and that uh, work anywhere, anytime. Okay, um, moving along, I want to remind everybody this is a recorded webinar and that this will be posted uh, within a few days, spider.datacaller.com. Some of our other recorded topics, you know, one of the things that, that we would really try to do is to talk about, of course, talk about color management, but what we really try to do is to help people become better photographers and videographers. So we have material on the convergence of still in motion capture, architectural photography, remote triggering. There's about 30 or 35 uh, webinars recorded on there that you can take advantage of for free. So I, I encourage you to go to the website, uh, browse through the library, see if there's something there that you can uh, that you can use. Uh, one of the most popular ones is screen to print match, which people use all the time. And I'm waiting for a message. I'm going to go through this next slide here. Uh, I want to thank Data Color for sponsoring this session. I really appreciate their support. Our giveaway is a Spider HD. And the winner for that is Gino Genova. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Gino, we will be getting in touch with you. Our marketing manager will be getting in touch with you to get your contact information. We'll be getting that out to you. And I also want to point out that this 20% discount off all Data Color Spider products, excluding the HD, uh, purchased on the website, and that's valid through June 11th. Uh, our our presenters today are myself, David Saffer, and C. David Toby. Uh, our websites and blog addresses are listed here, but more importantly, I think what I want to mention is that I do answer questions from my students. I'd be happy to try and help you, dsaffer at mac.com. If I don't answer you right away, it means I'm probably on the road or otherwise occupied or in an onslaught of emails, I miss it. So please don't be afraid to nag me and send the email again, and I'll be happy to try and help you. Thanks again for joining our webinar. We have others coming up, so keep an eye on the website, and have a great week.